share the large monitor because it makes it hard for everyone else to see. So uh, my name is Kevin Huck and I'm from the University of Oregon. Um, and I'm just gonna do a brief, a very brief overview of Tau and then a brief overview of Apex. And then, so, and then I wanna go into um, some of the auto tuning stuff that we're doing with Cocos kernels um, uh, on Perlmutter and, and show some examples and, and talk about some examples. And so this is, um, this is actually a very similar presentation to what I presented uh, back in December at the, at the user group meeting, uh, the Cocos user group meeting. So first we'll talk about Tau. For those of you who are not familiar, um, Tau is uh, the tuning and analysis utilities, the Tau performance system. Uh, it's a performance measurement library that's been developed for almost 30 years at the University of Oregon, um, supporting many different parallel systems over the years. Um, and it's an integrated performance toolkit, uh, which provides multi-level performance instrumentation if needed. Um, it's highly configurable uh, as, as you would expect from a project that's been around and has run on so many different machines. Um, it's wide, widely ported um, and it has portable visualization and, and analysis tools, um, similar to what you saw with HPC toolkit. We have Java tools, but we're trying to develop some Python based analysis tools for the future. Um, we endeavor to support all of the major HPC programming models um, at, at the semantic level where it makes sense. Um, so that includes things like MPI and Shmem, uh, OpenMP, OpenACC, CUDA, HIP, Sickle, um, and Cocos. And so what we also have in Tau is support for machine learning and AI frameworks. So for example, TensorFlow, PyTorch, Horovod um, have all been used with Tau. Um, we can get measurements of high level and low level libraries with those, including the Python calls. Um, Tau is integrated with Pappy and Liquid for hardware counter support. And we'll see some examples of that later um, with Apex. Apex is very similar to Tau, but we're gonna talk about Tau here first. So there's, the Tau main website there is listed, the tau.uoregon.edu, where it's the, our, our main project website. And as far as the tools themselves, we have a public mirror on GitHub, um, which gets updated every night at midnight Pacific, uh, sometimes more frequently when we're testing, but um, just for technical reasons, we don't have it mirror automatically every time we commit. But the set, basically whatever is our current development branch gets mirrored out to GitHub. Um, but for official releases and things, you'd wanna go to the main website. Okay, so for performance measurement, um, Tau, uh, for many years, and certainly from its beginning, it de depended on timers. Um, and this requires instrument instrumentation of some kind, whether it's manual or automated instrumentation. Um, it can be, the automated instrumentation uh, can be done at the source level, uh, can be injected by the compiler, and it can also be done uh, at the binary, when, once the binary is compiled uh, using uh, Dynast API, for example. Or three different, three or four different libraries that we use for doing binary re rewriting of executables to inject instrumentation. Um, but there's also several, several different libraries that provide callbacks for us to integrate with. So for example, MPI, OpenMP, uh, as, as you saw with the HPC toolkit, the vendor library supported, uh, supporting CUDA and HIP and Sickle. Um, we also have uh, API wrappers. So for example, if you wanted to wrap a particular um, I.O. library, for example, HDF5 or um, uh, NetCDF, you could wrap the library using uh, uh, the tools that come with Tau, um, and then you can wrap every API call. Um, and then we also do weak symbol replacement, which is used for measuring things like um, POSIX API or MPI itself, uh, excuse me, POSIX, all of the POSIX API, as well as uh, MPI. And timers, you know, are simple to implement and high, easily portable. Um, and so they're, they're pretty commonly supported. Uh, Tau also supports sampling, uh, similar to what you saw with HPC Toolkit. Um, sometimes requires uh, specialized, well, I mean, it requires specialized system libraries and support, but they're pretty widely available uh, with any Linux system. Um, we just use periodic signals to interrupt the program interrogate the call stack and then um, and collect samples and then uh, aggregate them at the end of execution. And, and similar to what you saw with uh, John's tool, there's no modification necessary to the executable uh, when you're using sampling. Um, 
there is a potential to interfere with system support. If the system has signal handlers, we haven't seen that very much in the last few years. Um, but we can also mix the samples with timers to generate a hybrid profile. Uh, let's see. So, um, so Tau supports profiling and tracing. So with profiling, um, we're just aggregating how much time was spent in each measured function on each thread in each process, essentially. So we're collapsing the time axis and we're not presenting any ordering or causal in event information or anything like that. And you get a small summary per thread per process, regardless of the execution time. It only really scales with the number of timers and, and threads and processes. We've collected um, profiles with over 100,000 um, threads of execution in the past and not had issues with those. Um, tracing, on the other hand, we're recording every function entry and exit in a, in a timeline. And it provides you a detailed view of what happened, which is really great if you're trying to do some uh, uh, cause and effect type uh, analysis for performance analysis, but um, you do, at the longer the program runs, the bigger the trace, and it also scales with the, the size of your allocation. Um, the, the analysis tools that Tau provides are uh, Paraprof, and then also uh, there's JumpShot for trace analysis that comes with Tau, but uh, there's a much better tool, uh, Vampire. It's a commercial tool, but it's usually installed on all the DOE um, HPC systems. So in the upper left, you see um, the uh, some views from Paraprof. So here's an MPI communication matrix, for example, uh, a 3D profile view where we have the different uh, functions along one axis, uh, the different threads of execution along another axis, and then we can have either the height or the color be either inclusive or exclusive different metrics. So for example, you could have time as one metric, uh, you could have the height be time or the color be um, floating point operations or something to that effect. You can mix and match. And then usually what we work with is the, the profile view, looking at a breakdown you know, per thread of execution where the time is being spent in different functions. And then here's a, a view of what the Vampire uh, trace viewer looks like. Let me make this go away. So let's talk about uh, Coco support in Tau. Um, so since February of uh, 2017, uh, Tau has supported the uh, Cocos profiling API, which comes with uh, Cocos. And what the way this works is Tau, like all the other performance tools, will set an environment variable uh, at pointing, telling Cocos uh, which library to load and look for the symbols that are going to implement various functions that it's going to use for callbacks for different Cocos events. And what Cocos expects are implementations for the Cocos initialization and finalization so that the tool can set up and tear down. Um, it's, uh, it provides uh, API calls or specifications for beginning and ending parallel regions, either fours and scans and reduces. Um, and it also provides these uh, calls for profile region, which I think there'll be more talk about this um, later in the day, but um, you can add profiling uh, instrumentation into your Cocos application using Cocos push and Cocos pop for different regions, and those are all honored by the, the performance tools as well. The names of the regions are passed on to the tools to provide some intelligent labels. And so John was talking about how there are, typically what happens is the kernel that gets executed either on the device or on a CPU is a 4,000 character expanded template um, demangled C++ name, which was very difficult for a lot of users to trace back to the original source code. And so this API provides a way to provide labels uh, for performance tools to uh, allow the user to give a human readable name to various uh, Cocos calls. So in addition, uh, Tau is going to support all the native backends. So for example, pthreads, OpenMP, OpenACC, CUDA, HIP, SICL, um, no code changes are necessary to support all those various backends. Um, and let's see. So Here's some, a uh, couple of little examples. Um, so this is from the Cocos mini apps uh, repository. There's a Lulesh application and I know Lulesh is, you know, we're not supposed to be using anymore, but it's still a useful example uh, in that there's a Cocos implementation of it. And what you see on the left is the main thread of execution. Let's see, where's my, there it is. So the main thread of execution launching various Cocos kernels, um, and then on the right side, what we see is the actual CUDA 
activity um, on the device. And so this is a virtual thread showing the activity of, of what's happening on the device. Okay. So now we're gonna move on to Apex. And so um, that was a very brief overview of what Tau does. And it's now with, with Apex, what we're looking at is a different tool, but in the same vein. So what Apex is, is the uh, autonomic performance environment for Exascale. And the way it differs from Tau is in a couple different ways. One is that it, while it does the performance measurement, um, it is targeting asynchronous tasking runtime systems. So systems like HPX um, and a number of other asynchronous uh, examples of which um, you could probably think of Cocos as an, as an example of that where Cocos is an abstraction on top of other layers like CUDA, HIP and Sickle. And as far as a tasking context graph, um, you could think of the activity on the, on the GPU as being linked to the activity that was being launched from the CPU. Um, and then the other important aspect for Apex is runtime adaptation, which I want to get into um, in a little bit, which is be being able to um, auto-tune certain heuristic set parameters within applications, most of which uh, I think we're all familiar with you know, various magic numbers that we find in codes where someone 10 years ago has decided that you know, some parameter, you know, 0 0.05 is a good setting for this value. And then everyone, no one thinks about it ever again, although the systems evolve and the problems change and maybe that heuristic value isn't correct anymore. Or it's just, you have the evolution of hardware and certain param parametric decisions you make um, may not be relevant for future ar architectures. And so this gives us the ability to, instead of having magic numbers, we can auto-tune for these various things and, um, and then cache those results and reuse them to have a more optimized execution. Um, so, as I mentioned before, it's for Apex is for asynchronous tasking runtimes. And so we focus on the task dependency graph, not necessarily the calling context graph. Um, and it supports a number of different uh, asynchronous, uh, potentially asynchronous uh, libraries and runtimes, including HPX. It was designed for HPX originally, but we've expanded it to work for several different libraries and, and models now, including C and C++ threads, so standard async um, and standard threads. OpenMP, OpenACC, Cocos, Raja, CUDA, HIP, Sickle, StarPU. We're currently working on YAKL, Iris, and, and a couple others. Um, there is a GitHub repository, which is a real-time mirrored, a mirror of our internal repo, as well as a, a tutorial link, um, a much more in-depth tutorial than what I can show in, in the next 15, 13 minutes. Um, and one of the, the so, thinking about the auto-tuning, typically auto-tuning is basically defined as a search problem. And so we have used a number of different uh, implementations for doing the, the parametric search. Um, initially we developed, we used Active Harmony, which provides an elder mead search, search algorithm. But in, in, the, in the meantime, we've also added things like simulated annealing, genetic searches for larger dimension parameter spaces, hill climbing, and as well as exhaustive and random searches. And hopefully we'll have time to look at lots of examples of these in a bit. Um, so this eye chart is a view of um, some performance data that collected by Apex for a, a, an executable called OctoTiger, which is an astrophysics code written in HPX and uses Cocos as well for abstraction. Um, and so HPX is being used as the asynchronous tasking runtime, but then for the different computational kernels, they are written in, Co or in Cocos and then launched on whatever available accelerator hardware uh, the, the system runs on, whether it be vector system. So for example, Fugaku or GPU systems, for example, Promutter or Frontier, which are different architectures entirely, or maybe Aurora with an Intel GPU. And so Apex can collect a number of different metrics, uh, scatterplot data, as well as uh, the task uh, dependency graph, or you can see, so here's a, a task graph and then the full task tree up here where you see um, Oct OctoTiger is a Oct tree based uh, application. And so you can see the different levels of, um, of uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Resolution as the, ex as the executable goes through the different levels of resolution in, in the application. Uh, so here is an example of a concurrency view from one node, and this may be confusing at first, um, 
uh, when you're looking at it, but essentially we have time along the x-axis and the number of active uh, threads um, on the on the y-axis. And what you see is during the first, say, 120, 130 seconds, we have initialization to fa fairly um, synchronous uh, uh, phase of the executable where it's loading data from disk and, and doing some setup. And then we actually get into the uh, iteration of the code. And ideally what you'd wanna see is full utilization of, 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 of a node. So for example, this is, we would have 48 cores. We'd wanna see them all busy. Um, but we see is the iterative uh, behavior of this application where we just sort of see spikes of fully occupied, fully utilized node, um, and then um, some occasional dips in between for inner iterations. Um, this is another ex executable or another application, the XGC. It's a tokamak plasma fusion uh, particle and cell code uh, running on Frontier. This is some data collected where we you know, collect the uh, task dependent. You could think of the call graph as a task dependency graph. And, and that's, that's basically what we're doing here. Um, and then we take the performance data and summarize it. And then we're basically taking the full task dependency graph, reducing it down to only showing um, a, a subset of the full tree where only where the accumulated times for any given timer are over five seconds. Um, and that reduces the full tree from you know, 6,200, 6,300 nodes down to just 72 nodes, a little more tractable for the human to analyze. And we can see certain, uh, we see load imbalances with respect to um, these MPI collectives, where, which are kind of in the intense red. We see some OpenMP kernels uh, that are uh, Cocos launching OpenMP kernels, as well as Cocos launching HIP kernels. And then we can also get um, just some flat profile data for these various um, timers. For example, this is the uh, push kernel is, is a computationally intensive kernel within that code. Um, and this is something I'm kind of proud of. A year and a half ago, before the AMD tools had really matured on Frontier, actually before Frontier had been delivered, we were on Crusher. And we were able to, um, you know, using Cocos and Apex and Pappy and the lib, uh, rock profiler libraries all combined together, we could get hardware counters uh, on Crusher and do some detailed analysis of one of, of the push kernel that I mentioned before. We knew with this particular kernel, we had register pressure. And so by adjusting the launch bounds, um, we were able to address this register pressure and as well have a nice side effect of um, better cache uh, performance, both the L100 or excuse me, the level one and level two cache performance for this code. And so we actually didn't see a great uh, performance improvement with this, but we did see some um, and a little bit helps. So this was about a 22% benefit. Um, we were kind of hoping to jump a lot higher, but you know, we're still working on this particular kernel. It's a rather large kernel um, that has a lot of inline code and is uh, just pre presents a lot of register pressure uh, for the machine. So one of the benefits of using a portable tool like Apex or Tau is that we can do, um, we can take a given code and execute it on several different architectures and do comparative analysis between them. And so by having a portable toolkit, we can look at OpenMP executions. We can look at CUDA and look at HIP. And this is these are trace views of Apex data in um, Perfetto, which we'll see some examples of in, in a little bit. But you know what's nice is we can look at the same uh, application compiled for both an OpenMP execution or a CUDA execution, execution or HIP, and be able to compare the, the results of, across the different architectures. Um, so as I mentioned before. Uh, very similar to Tau, Cocos support in Apex uh, has the same support, but in addition, um, provides the auto-tuning support. And for those of you who are not familiar, uh, Cocos provides the ability, the ability to auto-tune some of the features in Cocos uh, with uh, an additional CMake uh, configuration time parameter of Cocos enable tuning equals on or true or whatever you prefer for your CMake variables. And what this does is it provides, uh, automatically provides input and context variables, which we'll kind of talk about a little bit uh, for parallel for, parallel reduce, parallel scan and parallel copy for a couple of different policies. Um, the team policy and MD range, for example, are, are provided uh, out of the box. Range policy is currently um, being 
dusted off. There was an old fork and branch that had range policy support, but that uh, has it has not been merged into the full uh, Cocos yet, but we're working on it. But what's nice about this is you can also use the same API to do some custom tuning. So one of the examples that we'll talk about in a little bit, the Apex Cocos tuning has examples like the, the matrix multiply 2D tiling example, which allows the auto tuning API to examine different tiling parameters and find out what's the most efficient. And then also there's another one that's called the, the I don't I don't care or I don't know just multiply, matrix multiply. And what that example does is it has two different implementations of a matrix multiply. One of them is a team-based policy and one is a MD range policy. And it will choose, it'll auto-tune each of them and then also choose the better of those two implementations. And so this provides a rather complicated example of having a nested um, optimization search where we have um, uh, a, a nested search where we have a choice of two different algorithms and then we have tunable parameter, parameters for both of those algorithms. And here's an example of you looking at the XMNEMD uh, application and doing some auto-tuning on one of the uh, MD range kernels within that code. And we see that we explore different team sizes and vector lengths for this particular, um, uh, I'm sorry, this is, a, this is a team policy, not an MD range. And um, using simulated annealing, you can see that we explore several different variables. Um, and then we eventually converge down to um, our optimal settings. And you see, this is the response variable. So we see several bad choices. We see a few, we see some noise in the data as well. So this auto tuning parameter, uh, this auto tuning search provides a window. So you can collect multiple samples of a given setting and then choose the best performing because you might have different latencies that may not be related to your parameter choice. Um, so uh, in summary, for Tau and Apex, uh, for Tau, you would want to use it when you're doing advanced MPI or SHMEM member measurements, um, when, when you need sampling support or Python support, um, when you need to focus on the hardware and operating system context or some broader hardware support. Uh, Apex is useful when we're using any sort of asynchronous tasking runtime or um, we're focusing on an algorithmic task dependency and not the hardware or operating system. And um, we, or you want to use Apex for auto-tuning or a feedback and control. So now I'm going to jump to um, uh, Perlmutter. And so I mentioned before the, um, the GitHub repository. Actually, I will go back to the slides here and go back to, I do have an acknowledgement slide, of course, for the various funding agencies. And then we can jump into uh, some, some of the hands-on examples. So the Git repository is on GitHub. It's under a my login, my name, khuk, and it's the Apex Cocos Tuning repository. And if you download that, you can run the, so this is basically a repository I set up to help test the various auto tuning. And it has Git submodules for Cocos and uh, Apex, and it will build and run them uh, and build and run the examples. Um, the reason I don't use an installed version of Cocos is typically it's not built with the flag that enables the auto tuning. And so if we go to Perlmutter and we see what this repository looks like, um, there's a Perlmutter example or script to, to build and run. And you can see the various, there's a lot of CMake options here. A lot of these are here for my particular testing, but um, specifically what I wanna point out is the enable tuning on. And we see, so these, these parameters, for example, are part of the CI uh, testing parameters. I wanted to make sure there was no warnings, but then we have some Apex options as well. Uh, for this particular, we don't actually need either of these Apex options. The default CMake options for Apex would have been fine um, because we don't need the CUDA support in order to do the auto tuning. But if we go ahead and build this, I, let's, I've already built it, but if we run it, so, um, if I wanted to run these various tests, um, oh geez, oh because I'm running on the login node, of course. So these are going to try to run on the various GPUs, and I would need an interactive session to do this. But similar to John, I had some I have some CAN data already prepared, and so if I look at the we're going to look at the uh, IDK just matrix multiply. 
example. And so what this is doing is, this is a very short uh, program. If I, if I turn numbers on, you can see that there's only a hundred lines to this program. It's a very small little program. And what we do is we initialize uh, Cocos, we're printing out the configuration, and then we declare some views. So we have a left view and a right view, and, and then we have our output view. And we're just made, we're multiplying the left by the right and putting the result in the output. And this fastest of is just some helper code that's in a header library that will help us choose between two different implementations. And so for example, we have um, a parallel four that is using a team policy. Uh, let's see, where did it? Team policy. So this is a team policy implementation. And then we have a matrix multiply using an MD range. And when we run this, um, it actually run quite, runs for quite a long time because there's a lot of bad choices in here. But what we'll do, if I run this and collect a trace, then I can see what it looks like. And so this is the exhaustive tuning uh, example. And this is Perfetto. If you've never seen Perfetto before, it's uh, Google's um, like trace events, uh, trace visualizer. And um, so here we have, this is the CPU thread, and then we have our various uh, CUDA streams, and then a number of different counters that were collected uh, along the way, several of which aren't collected by default. I just turned them on so I could see what was going on with the tuning. Um, and so we, with the CUDA support, what we see is we are seeing the exhaustive exploration of the different parameters. And so we have our, uh, up here, I've pinned a few metrics and you can see um, we're evaluating, we're, this is an exhaustive tuning. So we're kind of switching back and forth between the two different implementations and then um, uh, exhaustively searching over all of the different choices for these different uh, tuning parameters. So for the, two, the team policy, we were tuning the team size and the vector length. For the MD range policy, we were tuning on um, tiling vector, or tiles, I think tiles. And so what that, what, what that affects, so these are the different input values that are, uh, I'm sorry, these are actually the CUDA measurements of what happens within uh, the execution. And so what you see is um, these, the green, uh, kernels here. This is a, uh, the parallel four, that's the outer, I guess, see, so this is the bad team gem. And then you see some pink here, and that's the MD range gem. And if we zoom in uh, for any of these particular executions, what you see is we see lots of bad choices along with very good choices. And eventually, as we uh, launch these kernels, I'm trying to. So one of the things that's nice about this particular trace viewer is being able to um, select a kernel. And so the launch for this kernel is actually um, up here. It's a very small event, but you can see the launch that goes from the CPU thread to the GPU thread. And then this is the kernel that executes. And what I wanted to show here was basically the, the exhaustive searching for this particular kernel. And then what happens at the very end of execution is we converge and then only the best setting is used from then on. And what you don't realize is that most of this time is the 750 or so iterations where we were trying to find the ideal setting. Sorry, this is between Zoom or between, yeah, between Zoom and this trace viewer, my system's a little bit overloaded. So as I zoom more into this, these are the last 350 of the thousand iterations um, using just the best settings. And there's a little bit of um, noise in there as well. But so you can see that eventually it converges to a good setting and then uses that good setting. And if we look at other search algorithms, for example, the random search, um, you see a lot more noise happening in the various search parameters, but eventually it will converge as well. And then we also have like genetic search, um, which uses a genetic search algorithm. And um, so that's basically just recombining better performing uh, combinations of parameters. In this case, there's two or three tuning parameters for each one. I'm sorry, two for each. 
And, um, and then we also have simulated annealing, which uh, does various uh, parameter explorations as well, and typically converges faster as well. And so, so for example, the simulated annealing run was a little more than five seconds, whereas the exhaustive tuning run was somewhere in the range of 45 seconds. So the simulated annealing obviously converged on the solution much faster. And then, so these auto-tuning results are then cached and those cached results can be used to run the same uh, executable. And this should run in say one second at that point, as opposed to whatever the default would be. And I think I've gone over the time allotted, but... Um, one very quick question. Do the, yes. different, the, the different strategies converge to the same answers? That's a great question. Um, all of so both the conjecture genetic search and simulated annealing will have some stochastic uh, behavior, and typically they converge to very similar results, um, but not always the same results. Sometimes they get stuck in local uh, local optimizations as opposed to a global optimization. Um, yeah. So I mean, essentially, that's one of the things that we need to do to make sure that we're actually getting good. We see this running faster, but it doesn't always converge to the same settings. And the question is, is why? <laughs> so any other questions? So, yeah, if anyone has questions, feel free to uh, reach out to Kevin. I'm actually, so I'm going to hand it over uh, to Samir quickly. Um, uh, he has, uh, so he's actually going to talk a little bit more in depth on Tau, um, kind of com complimenting Kevin's uh, talk, but just going a little more in depth. So yeah, I'll um, uh, hand it off to you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, the Tau performance system can be used with Cocos and it provides a viable option for performance observability. Tau, uh, as you heard from Kevin, uh, aims to deliver a scalable, portable performance evaluation toolkit. And it's part of this larger project called E4S, the Extreme Scale Scientific Software Stack. Tau does support many backends for GPUs, including uh, uh, NVIDIA GPUs with CUDA, OpenACC, OpenCL, we support Rockham, DPC++, Sickle for Intel GPUs, and uh, it provides a robust profiling and tracing toolkit that you can use with uh, uninstrumented applications. Now, some of your applications may use timer libraries, uh, including frameworks like PetC or XGC, which has scam timers, or, or you may be using Cocos, and we can use the hooks provided by those libraries effectively and use tau exec as the tool to launch it. I'll show you a few examples and how it is used on Perlmutter. Uh, there's the three main parts of instrumentation, measurement, and analysis of tau. And in case you're wondering what can tau show you, it can show you where your application spends its time at the routine level, loop level, at the kernel level with GPUs, and it can even show you data transfer between host and GPU, the time taken for memory copies, the PAPI counters that are available. And very importantly, it can show you the time spent waiting at a barrier in a MPI collective operation. We refer to this as the MPI collective sync time. It can show you memory usage, energy usage, IO, and also how your application may scale. Now with Cocos, as you're familiar with Cocos, we can create performance portable codes, and Cocos provides a profiling interface that integrates with Tau. Well, how does this profiling interface look like? Kevin covered some of this, and uh, there are routines for parallel for, parallel reduce, parallel scan, and region push and pop that we support in Tau. And uh, Tau tracks the kernel names specified as the first parameter in this uh, API that uh, Cocos provides for Cocos parallel for. And when the name is not specified, it uses the template instantiation. It uh, demangles the C++ entities. It maps the Cocos regions to tau phases. And in a phase, you can see all the calls that are called directly or indirectly. 
and we also support other runtimes. So if Cocos is using OpenMP, we can use OMPT to show you the details of the OpenMP uh, runtime. We can do the same for pthread, CUDA, Rockham, Sickle, uh, et cetera. And it allows you to look through multiple layers of the runtime system. And this is a simple example from Examine MD. You can see that there is an update halo phase and you do a push region and a pop region uh, at, at the bottom. And then you have a parallel for where you give this first parameter in Cocos. Now this is the parameter that will show up in the tau profile files in tau traces. And you can see in a phase, this level of nesting, which shows you that in the update halo com phase, we have these Cocos calls and these OpenMP calls. And the time spent in MPI send when it was in the update halo region. So this is within a phase. And within a phase, you can see the time spent in MPI send in this update halo. You can see the OpenMP timings and the other parallel for regions. And this com MPI update, uh, halo update self is the, is the actual first parameter that the user specifies in the Cocos call. And uh, you can also see timings in other uh, uh, run times, like you may see CUDA timings, like CUDA device synchronize. You can see the time spent with uh, the event-based sampling support in Tau. So you can go right down to the source level and see what's happening in a function, say, called reference at cocosviewmapping.hpp header at line 2740. And you can also see timings in system calls like this, like schedule yield call, called by MPI all reduce and so on. So having a combination of event-based sampling along with the Cocos API support and other runtimes allows us to get a full view of the application and see what's happening. This is what uh, happens in the launch of the kernel. And you can see the timings over here on each of the GPU threads and jump shot with the tool that we ship with Tau. It originally comes from Argonne National Labs and uh, we are very grateful that they allow us to ship it with Tau. And so it's a trace visualizer. It shows you boxes within boxes and communication events are shown as directed line segments. So you can see a full trace file and then uh, you can uh, use other third party tools as well. Now to instrument the code, we have this Tau exec app. We can also do source instrumentation or compiler-based instrumentation, and you can generate profiles as well as traces. And this is a dot .tau application, a top level timer, so to say, in the, in the profile file. So uh, with this, let me just show you some quick views of uh, exclusive, inclusive time using Jumpshot, uh, perfecto.dev, or the Chrome browser. To use that, you must turn on the tau trace environment variable, run your application, and merge and convert the traces like this. Once you have a JSON file, it can be loaded in a Chrome browser. You can load it in a perfecto.dev uh, GUI, which comes from Google. And you can also generate OTF2 traces. Now to do that, all you have to specify is an environment variable that says, besides tracing enabled, you have to say, Tau trace format is OTF2, and then you launch your application, which is uninstrumented with Tau exec, and there is no need to merge or convert the traces. You can see the, the traces in Vampire, and you can see over here the names of the events are Cocos parallel for, for calc, kinematics, for LMs. These names are the first parameter that you give to the Cocos parallel for call. So there is no change to the source code. There is no change to the build system. There is no change to the executable. You just launch it with tau exec, and then you can specify with the dash t parameter some of the tags. So you can have multiple configurations of tau and still use it with this simple tau exec tool and enable other, uh, other options like event-based sampling. Here are some examples of how you can also enable the backend options for GPUs, whether there's 
Kupti for CUDA profiling tools interface for NVIDIA GPUs or Kupti with the unified memory or Rockam or level zero for Intel, OpenCL, OpenACC, OMPT, all of these are supported along with the event-based sampling. And the best part is you can mix and match these options. There are some proof, paraprof is the GUI that uh, Kevin showed. And you can uh, see some views, you can expand uh, the columns and see the details of what happens at the statement level. You can see at this line number 228, it took 0.14 seconds and see the source code. You can see uh, events such as uh, bytes transferred from host to the device. And it also supports Python. And you can look inside the vendor libraries using event-based sampling. Uh, you can expand the call stack look at uh, the uh, event-based sampling with unwinding the call stacks. And this is identifying the time wasted in your application at an MPI barrier, which occurs implicitly in a collective operation. So you can see that if the application spent 574 seconds in an MPI barrier, this time came from MPI all reduce, which contributed 382 seconds to the time wasted in MPI barrier. And then you can see where that MPI all reduce gets called from various routines. And this is the COCOS parallel for with set buffer particles D. This is the first argument that shows up in the profile file along with other instrumentation hooks. Mind you, this entire code was just uh, run with no modification to the binary. And these are CAM timers, these are MPI timers, there's the tracking of barriers and COCOS calls, which happens uh, like this. Now with this, I'll just like to switch to a hands-on session. Here are some 3D views of our Paraprof profile browser and communication matrix uh, that is uh, available. We also have now support for rewriting binaries and rewriting shared objects. So if your application uh, is uh, using say libhdf5.so, you can just point to the hdf5 library and say, rewrite this library with the dash L parameter for uh, library rewriting and then run it with tau exec, then only the hdf5 functions will have start and stop timers. So you can get detailed traces which show you entry and exit events. This works right now on x86. We are trying to support it on AR64 and there are a couple of GitHub issues filed. Uh, and this is how it looks. You can see all the HDF5 functions with entry and exit instrumentation. This is part of the work we are doing with the STEP project. And there are various uh, runtime environment variables that you can set. I have a set of slides here. You can go through these and send us email if you have any questions, you can install Tau on your laptops like this. And this is where a lot of our research work goes on at the University of Oregon. I would like to thank our sponsors for supporting the Tau project, especially the Exascale Computing Project and the Office of Science to the PESO project and the STEP project. Uh, here is uh, the hands-on that I have put together. Now you can see that uh, by loading these modules, you can pick the COCOS GPU 4300 module, load the tau module, you can pick tau exec, I have a tag called CUDA 12.2 for the CUDA 12.2. And you can use this for a serial application like this, for a parallel application with MPI like this, and launch pprof or paraprof. So let me just quickly show you how this looks. Here is the XA Mini MD application. I have already allocated a node. And uh, to run it without tau, I would run it like this. I, I just take the executable and I, I launch it like this. Now I'll get rid of any profile files and I will just use which tau exec. It comes from this 233.2 directory and I'll just launch it 
with this tau exec command. Now you see, I am uh, running it with uh, Kupti over here, enabling the support for Kupti event-based sampling. And, and uh, I can also use it with the uh, CUDA 12.2 option. I think by default, it's using 11.7. And uh, we, we can use the other option. Okay. I launched this with the latest uh, version. And if I want to pick the CUDA 12.2, I just say 12.2, like it's in the slides. I can say MPI, Kupti, and then uh, all of these options. Let me start with just using the CUDA profiling tools interface. By default, all of the Cocos calls will get instrumented and we'll be able to see the time spent in, in this. Oh, just a second. Okay, here is, uh, there was some residual thing from the previous run. And you can see that this ran it with tau exec and it's running it on the GPU. You see the four A100 GPUs and it's using the Cocos profile library and so on. And so with this, we can then see the data generated by the code. And maybe I should just uh, stop it and see the profile files directly. So here, you see, when I say pprof, it's showing me Cocos parallel for, and that force LJ neighbor compute is the function. And it shows you halo update self. It shows you the exchange halo, com exchange. These are the groups. You can see the parallel for calls all showing up in the profile files. Along with the CUDA, I had enabled the, the Kupti option. So the CUDA device synchronize, CUDA mem copy async and MPI collective sync. So it's not wasting much time in the barrier. That's good. And I can then see what's happening with the events such as bytes copied from host to device, device to host, where the data transfer takes place in the COM exchange with the parallel for COM exchange pack, exchange self. So you can get detailed information about the data transfer as well as on thread one, I can see what's happening on the GPU. So these are the kernels that were running on the GPU. So you see Cocos implementation of CUDA parallel launch constant memory is the name of the kernel. There's time spent in context synchronized. You can see the launch uh, for another. And the detailed uh, demangled names are available to you separated on a GPU node compared to the CPU. And I can take this, I can even say paraprof and pack it. Let me pack it and call it, say maybe XR mini MD and four processors dot PPK. So PPK is an extension for paraprof profile format. And I can, uh, let me just get a, Let me just uh, go to Perlmutter, go to the PPK directory and pull in this XR mini MD 4p.ppk profile file. And I can launch this XR mini MD 4p.ppk and see the same data now through a paraprof browser. So here, if I look at the thread statistics table, it shows me that this was uh, executed on Perlmutter. These are the directory, how it was run. It can show me the GPU name and details about the GPU. And this is the thread zero where I can see the time spent in different uh, Cocos uh, uh, regions. So you can see the Cocos parallel for 
parallel reduce and CUDA device synchronize and all of these functions. Let me go over to another, uh, another node. And this is say thread one. So here I can see the actual execution of the kernel, the implementation with CUDA. So because Tau can support instrumentation with the CUDA profiling tools interface, as well as with Cocos, I can get such detailed information. Let me just take uh, some time to just go to a Cocos simple example. Let's say this is a CMake example.cpp. I'm trying to, this is a simple test case where this is a count functor. I'm trying to count the number of even integers from zero to n minus one. And I take n as a command line option and run this count functor with the parallel reduce operation and then calculate the time. And then I do the same thing sequentially like this. And if I build this code and uh, uh, run it, I have example with Cocos and I can give a, a, a large number like say, So here it says that uh, to calculate uh, the number of even integers from uh, you know zero to forty million or nearly forty million, it takes and the answer is uh, you know twenty million, which is correct. It takes zero point zero 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 one second when it's run on the GPU, but if I do it serially. Sequentially, it takes 0 0.04 seconds. So you can see the huge difference with using the GPU. So if I wanted to run the same thing with tau exec, if I say coda 12.2 and I'll say serial and enable kupti, you can see here there are no profile files. I can then uh, run this example like this. And uh, you see, there's a, only a slight difference in uh, timings. Instead of 0, 0, 0, 0001, it is again 0, 0, 0, 0016 instead of 11. One, one. So the perturbation is minimal. And I can see the time spent in this parallel reduce count functor. And this information comes from the Cocos profiling interface. I can see bytes transferred, I can look at the data and the actual kernels that were running on the GPU. Here are the implementation query kernel and the launch kernel. So you can get detailed information like that. And uh, you can even enable event-based sampling by just saying dash EBS. Okay, so here, now I can see with pprof, there is the time spent in CUDA device synchronized, IOCTL calls, and so on. So uh, I can take a quick question before I have to switch to another call, but uh, are there any questions? Yeah, and reminder, uh, put in any questions on like Google Doc too. I don't, I don't see any in the chat. Yeah. For, um, yeah. So th I mean, I, I, I think maybe for a very quick question, where do people go if they want to run? Um, so, so this example here, um, that, that you're showing is without MPI, um, yes. or, okay. So right. I showed both an example with MPI, which was XR mini MPI yeah. and without MPI. Yeah. The important thing to remember here is that uh, as you look at uh, the the execution of this tau exec command, you use either the dash t serial, which is used without MPI, or with the MPI, you can use MPI or even omit this parameter. But just remember to do the module use, module load tau like this, and then use tau exec, and you'll be able to get all this data with a Cocos program.
So try it and let us know how we can help. Yeah. Excuse me. Hi, Samir. And yeah, I was wondering uh, if there's some instructions on how to replicate this this um, tutorial on, a, for example, a cluster and another cluster. So if I wanted to test it on our, our company's clusters. Uh, oh, absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. We would like to maybe help you install Tau or you can use E4S to ah. install a full software stack which includes Cocos, which includes Tau, which includes CUDA oh, and course. all the tools will be available for you and you can just do a module load Tau then and uh, launch mm -hmm. your application. If you would like, mm -hmm. please get in touch with me at uh, my email address is over here and I'll be able to schedule a, you know, a screen share session where we can work on it together. Oh, awesome. Thank you. It's also available on the cloud if you're interested in any of the cloud providers. Mm, okay. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for inviting me, Vivek. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the talk. And yeah. And yeah. So thanks. Uh, uh, also, for thanks for Kevin. Um, and uh, so now we'll be actually. Um, Going on to, uh, um, so before I uh, go on to the next talk, what I wanted to say is, uh, so up to now we are, uh, we showed uh, tools that uh, are built basically on uh, using the tools profile interface or, or just instrumenting Cocos. Um, uh, but this next session, um, and, and, um, you know, discussion here is going to be more hands-on, uh, in the sense that it's, you're going to learn how to build your own tool, uh, for Cocos. And so this is useful for third-party connectors. Um, I mean, Apex is actually one third-party connector, but, you know, if you have your own, own software that you want to instrument, you can do so. So i I didn't have time in the beginning to really go into it, but um, uh, I wanted to mention there is an NVTX connector. Uh, yes, and Helen, I see a short break. Uh, yeah, uh, let me just mention this point. Uh, NVTX connector is the third party connector that hooks, um, that provides um, the, you know, uh, any of, the, it was, it, it's basically, used alongside the NCU uh, Insight um, tool. So you can, uh, it was actually previously called NVProf connector. So if you've used NVProf, um, <clears throat> this allows you to use NVProf with more uh, more meaningful names of Cocos function names in that NVProf uh, shown in the profiles. Um, <clears throat> so I, I won't go into depth in that, just because of time, but um, yeah, I will hand it off to Daniel. And the the you know, the reference on NVTX connector is on will be in the slides, actually. But before that, okay, so short break. Uh, sorry, Helen. Uh, can you? Uh, are we gonna take a short? Uh, do we need to go back into the main room? Is that is that what you're? No, just uh, I think let people like get a short break. It's just three hours straight. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Yeah, I did account. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Room, just yeah, come sure. back yeah, maybe yeah. ten minutes later or something. Ten minutes later. Yeah, that okay. Yeah, that's correct. Um, you can you can, you can show if it's exercise time. You can put exercise on on the screen and people can you know. Yeah, I'll show that on exercise. screen. But yes, uh, yes, we we're supposed to give a short. Break. That's what the other okay. room is doing. Okay. Uh, uh, is a non tool okay N nils uh you have a non tools technical question should i ask that here or in the other? uh you either way yeah i mean yeah you could if it's not about tools it's not necessarily relevant but yeah it, it was yeah I, I guess it has to do with template instantiations and cuda and hip and these kinds of things um and it so like i think it's on the very technical side um, so that's why I was like, I'm not sure, should I ask that here or in the other one? So you can put in the uh, Google Doc and pick a session over there. It's easier for people to see, but even maybe putting into the new user section day two, people will see. Yeah. Or you might... can, uh, yeah, go back to the main room and ask. 
I mean, I'm also happy to answer here, maybe. I mean, we wanted yeah. to take a break anyway for like, yeah. what, five minutes or something? Yeah, for a few minutes. Yeah, we're taking a break. Yeah, so go oh, okay. ahead. Yeah, no, no, it's awesome. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the, my worry about typing is it'll probably be three paragraphs. Um, so basically, uh, we have a code and you know, we template on uh, the data structure. Uh, so we sort of have our own vector class and we'd be moving to Cocos vectors. But what, rather than like break everything and change all at once, we'd like to be able to transition this sort of slowly. Um, and so then the, these functions, the old data structure just won't run on a GPU. Um, so if we try to decorate these with Coco's function or like underscore underscore device, um, it, it's just not going to go. And that's because we depend on third party libraries. And so this is basically like a no go on the amount of right, like we would have to change thousands of lines in other repositories. Um, and so what I'm wondering is, if I have this function template, the, the implementation is the same regardless of whether we do Coco's vectors or the other vector, um, but can I instantiate the function template for Cocos and for the other type, with, let's say the Cocos one with device and host and instantiate the other one for only the host and then what do I do in the header file, if anything, or this kind of a thing? I don't understand sort of the interoperability here. Um, oh, okay. I mean, there's, I mean, ultimately, like, Cocos code uh, uses the, the backend um, where it's running, kind of, right? So <laughs> you... Um, I mean, if you if a Cocos function is a host device function, then you can obviously also call it on the host. And so it should just work if you annotate it with the Cocos function. Um, assuming that you, I mean, that you compile all of your project with the same compiler, which can understand uh, CUDA as well. Yeah, so we would basically use the Cocos compiler wrapper always, um, and then basically just switch so so let me let me do a screen share here maybe this is even going to be even easier if i actually write some pseudo code i don't know if i'm um what be able to... yeah um is that coming through there should be a terminal window yeah yeah okay so basically i have and then um so scalar here mm -hmm. is basically a, a simple wrapper. And then let's just do something like this. Um, and then I would want to somewhere do template. Uh, and this I would want. I guess, and then uh, sorry, you know, and then then the appropriate Cocos things filled in here um, with the dimensionality and stuff. Um, and so then what I'm not sure on, and in part of this I haven't tried, but the reason I'm asking is maybe you just know the answer or have tried doing this. Um, what this So this would be in the, in, in the HPP and this would be in the CPP. Uh, and then here's like, what do I do here in terms of annotation? Like if I did this, with host device. Well, you always use Cocos function. But Cocos function translates to host device, right? Essentially. Yes. Right. But then I mean this I cannot do. The backend. Right. But right. But this I cannot do host device. That will not mm -hmm. compile. Right. So so basically I can do Right, but the, the specialization you can do Cocos function. Um, this is just an instantiation. There's no. 
specialization here. Oh. Like I, I have one function. But I mean, if you cannot instantiate, I mean, um, yeah, well. Right, so I have one implementation that would basically something like this. And then I just want to instantiate it once for the the vector type and once for the Cocos view. And they, now, I don't know if you've tried to do this before or I guess here it would presumably still be. Well, Cocos I mean, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a problem if you can't even instantiate it on the, on the device, right? Like, I mean, you can always like do some if const express stuff, um, possibly that you only invoke things um, when you're on the device or on the, I mean, for specific types. And then you can always use like Cocos if on host or Cocos if on device if you want to guard certain codes. But I mean, it's difficult if you are not specializing, but only instantiating. <clears throat> because I mean, you need Cocos function if you want to use it with Cocos. Um, but if the instantiation otherwise doesn't work, then you can't really do that. Well, I don't want to right. I don't want to use this vector one with Cocos. I just need it for my own purposes. Right, and um, I mean, you could specialize instead of instead of instantiate. Oh, well, but then I have to re write, I, I mean, I gave you here, you know, this is like a one line example, but if I have a 400 line function that does a lot of math, I'd rather not copy paste the four line function because I have to specialize it. Uh, I'd rather just instantiate it separately, right? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think we should continue this this elsewhere so we can continue and uh, okay. wrap up with the presentation. Just ask on, on Cocos Slack. There are a bunch of people there. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Then, um, yeah, let me continue and, and wrap up uh, with Cocos tools. Yeah. Okay. All right. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Cool. All right, so this is a condensed version of, of our module seven that you can find in the Cocos tutorials. And I will go over like some more of the simple examples um, that we have, but then also like uh, build your own tool. So what's the problem that we're trying to, to solve uh, with Cocos tools in general? Well, um, we want to instrument something. We want to do some profiling and some debugging. Um, of course, there are already tools out there. We uh, heard a bunch of about a bunch of them um, earlier on. Um, in particular, with one of the, some of the vendor tools, uh, we have some problems um, with we just use Cocos. So this is like NVIDIA and Vpro for some truly nice example, and um, uh, you see this is like overly verbose. Like you don't really see what's going on. Um, just because Cocos is heavily templated. Um, so it's really yeah difficult to identify uh, what we see here, what kind of kernels are running and where we need to focus on. And um, yeah, so the problem really is that the, um, that, that everything is wrapped um, very much into like say a bunch of uh, kernel launch functions and um, all of that means that we see this this same name over and over again without any chance really to capture the the precise function names if we just go by what C++ has to offer and then also what a lot of the tools need to see. So um, we want to provide with Cocos tools some more help with that, um, like that we can um, integrate uh, or like like have our own hooks, um, our own information to give more Cocos specific information about uh, what you're doing in, in Cocos codes. Um, yeah. So we have, there are a bunch of tools uh, also uh, mentioned earlier, like NVTX, um, 
or ITT that have the uh, the capability to name functions or name regions. And this is actually something that we can use um, with the instrumentation layer that Cocos tools, Cocos P provides. So in particular, we know about like all the interfaces um, that we have. Like we know there is a parallel for parallel use, parallel scan. Um, we can begin a region or we have like some kind of deep copy or whatnot. We allocate or deallocate um, all of that have hooks in, in Cocos, so we can connect them to these particular connectors so that they give more useful information. And um, in general, um, there are like two parts to this. Like all the hooks that I talked about are like in the Cocos P interface. And um, these uh, can be used. You can just say, hey, whenever uh, like a uh, like a parallel four is launched or whatever, then call this, then use this callback um, and do something with it. And it's, yeah, it's, it's uh, implemented in terms of function pointers. So basically, if you don't connect anything, if it's just like a null pointer, then there is basically no overhead doing that and you don't have to rebuild the code. And then we provide on top of this a bunch of uh, Cocos tools that use this instrumentation layer to do particular things like that you could just replicate uh, on your own if you were so inclined. And um, basically the mechanism for that is like you build a tool and then you set Cocos tools lips as environment variable and then that should work. Some of them have like uh, some more environment uh, uh, variables to configure, but this is basically how it works. Okay, so how to get uh, this um, is basically you just uh, uh, download this repository, Cocos Tools, and, and this has all these, these things built in. Um, it It's just standard CMake um, and it builds all the tools that it can find that work right now. But again, like uh, loading the tools requires this Cocos tools lips. Um, we set that to a shared library and then it works and you can even uh, like nest some of them depending on the tool. And basically we can just uh, open the shared library, search for particular symbols, uh, symbol and connect it. Pretty simple. Okay, so if we look at an example um, like this, in this example code, we we kind of like have an allocation, we, we create a mirror view, um, we say we start some kind of region. So we say like, this is, a, this is a setup stage. So we say push region. And then at the end here, we say pop region. Um, so within this, we, we just set up this view, um, copy it from the host to the device. And then we have some kind of iteration region um, where we do a parallel scan and a parallel reduce. So um, with all this, uh, let me just move this uh, status bar, which is really annoying. Okay. Um, then we get with NVProf um, already uh, like this kind of imp uh, information. So basically, um, it's pretty messy, right? You see, like, uh, there's nothing demangled. You cannot identify anything. Um, in particular, if you just, like, extend, like, the first name um, and then demangle it, we see there are, like, so many layers. Um, it's pretty much impossible to understand what really took a lot of time. Okay, so what, what can we do better? I promised like we have all these connectors uh, and, and that stuff in the instrumentation layer um, hooked up. So what we can do um, is just use simple kernel timer, for example. So this is uh, just one of our own tools, um, which just goes through like all the interfaces uh, that we're calling um, and then like in uh, like, with the time, like just writes it out to a file um, and you can then then look at it. So again, what we do is to, to clone Cocos tools to then set Cocos tools lips and then basically just execute your uh, executable. And then you have a KP reader that, uh, that interprets the file that is written. Okay. 
So in comparison now, we see um, there are a bunch of regions. We have like a iterate region and a setup region with like particular timers here for like all, how long everything took. And then um, we see for the kernels, we have a parallel four in there um, with a name. Um, uh, we did not give it a name, but uh, yeah. Um, Oh, this this is view initialization. Sorry, we have like a parallel scan with the name K one with another view initialization with the parallel four, then the parallel reduce K two, and uh, another initialization uh, which calls a parallel four. Um, and yeah, so you see basically all the uh, all the labels that you got uh, that that you provided in your code are now visible in the tools. So it's very easy now to match um, what exactly you're running and how you labeled it. And it's custom, so like you can do whatever you want. You can give it proper like namespaces or whatever, whatever makes sense to you. Of course, this has uh, this capability has also some limitations because we only instrument Cocos uh, call, so you don't see um, whatever. Um, I mean, the low level uh, calls are not instrumented this way or whatever is, is otherwise running on the host. Um, this is, for this, you need then other tools. Okay. But uh, let's look again for, for this, this Tpetra example. And then uh, we see very nicely, uh, we have uh, like all these regions uh, like global, SPMV, AXP, BY, and, and stuff. So so that looks much better than, than what we had before. Okay. And similarly for the kernel output, we see uh, very clearly what was running. It's like sorted uh, by the runtime. So you can identify that, uh, that more easily and then maybe uh, isolate that kernel to introspect it some more uh, with the vendor tools. Um, or like HPC toolkit or uh, whatever allows you to to really look um, at the low level counters and instrumentation there. Okay. Um, another tool that we have is uh, the, for the memory space utilization. Um, there is memory high watermark, which just tells you what's the maximum utilization with like memory usage, um, which gives you a timeline. Um, for the memory usage and then memory events. So it tells you when did we allocate, deallocate something, the deep copies. And then also can give you like an idea on um, is uh, are the allocations a problem? Like, are you allocating uh, too often? Are we maybe forgetting to, uh, to uh, deallocate something? If you like go through some of the more manual uh, parts of Cocos, like Cocos Mellow, Cocos Free, where you manage your memory um, yourself, or if you're like running into issues that you're running out of device space or whatever, then you can like identify at which point in time some pointers are still alive and then make sure that uh, that you would like clean them up earlier uh, when you don't need them anymore. Okay, then we've seen before, there are a couple of, uh, there are like regions. So on top of what you would normally write in your Cocos programs, you can also set up like regions and say, uh, like I want to know about all the time that is spent in this particular regions. Um, and then you can also nest them. And that gives you like a, like a really nice overview um, of, of what's going on. Um, this is uh, in particular helpful for some later tools um, that we'll see in a second. And uh, how we'd use it is just, just you write push region and then uh, with a label and then pop region. So with pop region, we are like always assuming that you want to end the previous region. So you cannot have like uh, more overlapping uh, regions. Uh, there's only one active region at, at a time. Okay, so this can then be used uh, somewhat better, like say by space time stack, which is pretty much the go to tool for me. Like if I want to have like a very good overview of what's going on um, in, a, in a Cocos program, um, you can get a bottom up or top down data representation. Um, like 
based then on the regions. It can just tell you like in this region, we have these kernels um, and they are expensive, or you can then just like see um, on the other hand, like this kernel is expensive and is called by these regions. And then at the same time, also get an idea of um, which of the memory allocations that you did um, are particularly big. And yeah, um, as I said, this this is something that I would use. Uh, that's one of the first tools that I receive. Uh, I would use in Quarkus. Okay, <laughs> another problem um, is the delayed error problem, of course. So um, what we're doing here is uh, uh, we're looking at a at a parallel for basically. Um, and then we run uh, that here with a parallel four, and then then a reduce, and then we run into into like a, like a, some kind of problem, like we have a um, illegal memory access, um, and the problem is that oftentimes um, you see that like at the wrong point in time, like if you if you run this then you say, hey, pass, pass point A, but it's not quite clear if the error now comes um, from the first or the second call, right? In particular, since um, all the operations that you submit to Quarkus programs are normally like enqueued, right? But they're not synchronous uh, for most of the execution spaces. Um, so for debugging that, um, most uh, or a lot of the tools um, are actually fencing every kernel or at least have the capability to turn that on. So kernel logger uh, would actually tell you uh, exactly what kind of kernels are launched. And then with the um, additional fences and there you quickly see um, exactly at which point the, the problem was. Like it would print, uh, yeah, it would basically stop directly at that point instead of waiting for all the asynchronous operations to finish. So here we would see um, with the kernel logger, we first allocate something and we uh, execute the parallel four we, for, initializ uh, for initialization. Um, then this is done. So we have a fence at this point. Um, then we have this iterate region. And then we call um, this kernel. And then exactly here we see this is the problem. So that's nice. Um, there are a lot of like questions um, about these kind of issues on the user group, to be honest. Like a lot of times people just see, yeah, I run into this, this error, but have a hard time to actually locating where it comes from. And this is where, uh, really where kernel logger shines, since none of these tools uh, require the Cocos programs to be recompiled. So you can just, uh, just, just load a tool and then immediately see where it breaks. Okay. So, <laughs> The standard Cocos profiling approach, um, as we understand it, is uh, first we need to figure out how much time do we really like uh, spend in kernels? Um, like, do we actually do enough work in Cocos at all? And then just see what are like uh, really hotspot kernels. So oftentimes this can be done already with a simple kernel timer. Uh, then we can do a memory analysis, like how many allocations are we doing per second? Um, do we use too much memory at the same time? Do we need to allocate something? Um, and can we actually hoist some of the temporary allocations out so that we would not um, allocate all the time? That's not necessary. <laughs> um, as, a, as a rough benchmark, like 5,000 5, allocations per second is, is okay. This doesn't cause that much of a problem. Fire. Then after that, we can identify serial code regions with uh, like like space time stacks, which gives us more uh, information about the hierarchy of our views, um, and also then uh, tells us about regions uh, where we spend like little time. And then after that, uh, we need other tools um, to actually look at the kernels. This is something that 
Cocos doesn't provide on its own, but it relies on vendor tools um, like HPC Toolkit um, or VTune or uh, um, NVTX and com inside compute and all that kind of stuff. Um, and what we can do there is at least help these tools uh, name regions or uh, yeah allocations or um, or particular kernels um, according to to the labels that you are providing um, in in the cocos in your cocos program. Okay. So there's like one thing that I wanted to mention. Okay, but there, there is another there's a, there's an exercise for this, right? Um, so you can look at that. Um, it's there's a tiny mistake somewhere in this this tools mini MD, and if you follow this profiling approach here, then you should be able to find that pretty quickly. Um, you need to know like. Uh, about 50% of the time should be in a force compute kernel and 25% in the neighbor list kernel. Um, I don't want to go through this right now, but um, I would just want to leave time at the end for you to do that um, if you want to or have other questions um, or something like that. It's, it's a valuable exercise if you have never done it. Um, but yeah, so basic tools um, can give you a very good idea of what's what's going on. There's a lot of stuff that we already implemented, um, but there is more that you can do on your own. And that's what I want to talk about in, in this next and last section. So custom tools. We talked about the, the Cocos P hooks um, a little bit, they exist. Um, but here I want to show a little bit more um, how you can use them yourselves. Okay. So what will you need to do for that is, is basically write a simple C interface and you don't have to use all of them. You can just like hook to, uh, to whatever you, you need. If you just say, I just care about parallel force and you just use a parallel four hook. If you just want to have deep co uh, like copies um, or just look at regions, then, then you can do that yourself. And the nice thing about that is that you can um, just write something real quick that just works for your executable. Like you can just put that like maybe in line with your code um, already if you want to analyze it there or you build your own shared library for doing that. Okay. So what we typically need for any of these tools, um, since they are part of the hooks interface, is something like a space handle, uh, where we just store the name of execution or memory spaces, and then a unique device identifier. Um, so you see that these are, of course, not in the Kirkus namespace, um, but that's kind of this the C style structure that we that we require um, for all of these hooks. So you need to define uh, something like that, so Kirkus can call it. Um, with kind of this this uh, this information. Okay, so going through the hooks a little bit here, we have initialization and finalization hooks. Um, like when does the uh, library uh, get initialized? Um, the information that you get here is uh, then the how many tool I am, what is kind of like the version uh, that I have, um, and then you can set some of the device information. And similarly, then uh, for the finalized call, you get also notified about that. But I mean, you don't get like more information provided. And at this step, you can assume, I mean, then the program is over and then you can like write your results to files if you have not uh, analyzed anything on the fly. Then we have like all the Cocos P uh, begin parallel for begin parallel reduce and parallel scan um, hooks. They uh, provide you with a name, um, with the device ID, and then you can set the kernel ID um, to be uh, used later on. In particular, then um, in the Cocos P end parallel for reduce or scan call. So you can then identify um, which of the kernels um, is actually running. You see, like we only get a kernel ID uh, for the end parallel for and not a name anymore. So this is something that you would um, need to uh, need to then then map yourself. Okay. 
And we have a big indeed property again with a space handle now. So which gives you like kind of a name on which kind of resource this is running, uh, destination name, the source name, and then the size. Uh, pretty straightforward for when it begins and ends. Then we have the same thing for allocations and deallocations. And uh, I think this is pretty much it. <laughs> so um, this is this is all the things that you, that you can actually do. And how you would use it is to uh, say set hook callback. Um, so this is kind of like in the, the Cocos interface where you can do that. And then you just need to provide a function pointer uh, with the correct signature, basically. Um, and yeah, the hook can be any of those that we just talked about. And you can like get like the whole number of callbacks that are set up. You can set uh, individual callbacks. You can say, I don't want to use the tools right now, but then I want to uh, reload them at another point. You can do that with all these API calls like with pause tools and resume tools, which is pretty powerful. Okay. So a quick example here is um, this is all inline in, in your Cocos program. So you would just um, say like here in the main, um, I want to, to initialize Cocos and then I want to um, set a callback for allocating and deallocating and the callbacks are provided here. So we just print um, the label, the pointer, uh, sorry, uh, we just print the pointer um yeah the, the the we just print the label and the size basically for allocating and deallocating so that's a very simple tool very similar to just look at all the allocations that are happening okay so the last thing i want to talk about is a throwaway de debugging tool and i will show that briefly also in my terminal, um, which just says like, um, I want to know what the content of a view is before and after a kernel um, every fifth time that a particular kernel is called. So the view is on the GPU um, and some rank of a large run. So you could also like provide maybe some information on what kind of rank that is and it's with this approach, then easy to exactly get the information that you want, even if it's just specific and works for your tool. Okay, what we need um, is to store the pointer and the size of the view uh, with the label. We need to identify um, the particular kernel that we're running um, and then print the view before entering kernel and before exit exiting it and hope that it doesn't then get uh, deallocated in the, in the meantime. So all of that takes a little bit information also about um, how allocations are actually handled within Cocos. So what we're doing here is uh, now writing a library. So we need to have this uh, extern C interface to it where the uh, name needs to be Cocos SP allocate data and then the space handle as defined before. And basically uh, we say, oh, we only care um, about this particular view, which has uh, like the label puppy weights here. And then um, we have to know that the data pointer that you need to store is offset from some header information um, by like 32. So this is like a little bit nasty to do. Um, but then you also know this, the, the, the size because uh, you know what kind of data you're storing. So you need to divide the size uh, passed in by the actual uh, size of the value type. And at this point, we can also say like, okay, now we we want to say, uh, we want to start counting. And then with the uh, print view, uh, we would in this example just basically call print f on that data. Uh, we need to be a little bit careful here that we like uh, that we this data probably is on the device, whereas this is like executed in the host. So technically, we need a mem copy here. Uh, I just omitted that for like sake of brevity so it would, would fit on the slide. And then we can set the callback here for the begin parallel four. 
and say uh, we only want to uh, to look at this if like the name of the view is is puppy on couch. Uh, uh, sorry, the name of the uh, of the kernel is, is Puppy on Coach. And then we increment our count and every fifth iteration, we then print the data and say, now we are interested in doing something with it. And um, then in the Cocos uh, P and parallel four, we only observe the kernel ID and, and see if that matches. And since we already know that we only increment the count here um, in uh, the begin parallel four, we can also check here that we are in the correct iteration and then print the data again. Okay. So for like this simple example, um, this would look like this. So we just do like something very simple. Um, we say like we, we have a view with like four elements and then we run a parallel for 10 times, and then this is kind of the output that we're getting. I just want to, to basically show this code um, real quick. Um, oh, sorry, I need to uh, then share a different screen real quick. Um, let me see. Did I... Okay. Oh, okay, so, so this is basically uh, that. Um, I just wanted to look a little bit more about the setup here. Um, I just put that in the example directly in Corpus, which should not matter that much. But this is kind of like what your CMAC lists uh, need to look like. So you just create an executable. Uh, as usual, then you need to create a shared library like this. Um, and then um, you possibly uh, yeah, need to need to understand if your tool needs to do the mem copy um, or not. And then we just link um, only the example to Cocos. And so the uh, our library or shared library is not linked. Okay, so, and then um, we basically just say, okay, uh, we built this now. Uh, we provide the Cocos tool slips with the tool that we just built and we execute it. And then we see this output. Basically, uh, we see we have only one iteration really, and we print um, the view before the parallel four and after the parallel four, and we see that the view has been updated. So the setup is really not that difficult. You really just need to be able to to build a shared library and then point it point to it yourself, and that's it. Okay. Let me go back to the presentation, um, just to 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 wrap that up. Okay. Um, implementing your own tool really is not that difficult. If you want to do uh, some instrumentation just in your uh, in your particular application, you can either just like set the hooks, which is easy, where you can resume, pause, uh, and whatnot. Um, or you can even like uh, write like a full fledged library um, that you can just like load in um, whenever you want to. The first approach obviously needs uh, that you recompile your application, whereas if you just build a shared library, then you don't need to do that. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I encourage you to look at uh, that example yourself and play a little bit with it. Um, the slides uh, presented here are also in the Cocos Slack, uh, uh, in particular in the uh, in the respective uh, workgroup uh, thing uh, for for this uh, for this event. In summary, we have seen there are a bunch of uh, Cocos tools um, that you can already use um, using the Cocos P interface. Um, there are a bunch of co uh, connector tools, which I have not talked about specifically here since uh, we saw that uh, in earlier presentations. And then you can also build your own uh, own hooks. And yeah, that's it from my side. Uh, and I wanted to leave some time in the end to ask more questions or give you some time to, to maybe go through one of the exercises and I'll be around. <laughs>